This is the second part of the overview lecture about World War II. As I explained in the last lecture, I will not be going into deep detail here. You covered World War II last year in World History II. Instead, I'm going to focus on the big events and themes. Remember, the main focus of this lesson is what's happening on the home front in the U.S. during the war. Think of this lecture as an attempt to jog your memory so that you can make connections between the home front and the two main theaters of war, Europe and the Pacific. Just weeks after the bombing of Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, the country kicked into high gear. We went from being just an arsenal of democracy through the Lend-Lease program to a full-fledged participant. Tensions were really high in the United States. The passing of the Smith Act in 1940 that monitored the activities of foreigners already showed an anxious concern about spying and collaboration with enemy countries. Another manifestation of this fear resulted in a legal challenge to the restriction of civil liberties in wartime, just as Schenck versus U.S. had done in the First World War. Two months after Pearl Harbor, FDR issued an executive order, that is an order issued by the president that has the force of law. Executive Order 9066 required all Americans of Japanese ancestry to relocate to internment camps as a matter of national security. You'll read about the internment camps in your textbook this week, so I won't dwell on it here. But suffice it to say, it represented an enormous infringement on the rights of fellow Americans. One person, Fred Korematsu, seen here in the upper right-hand corner, refused to obey the order, and he was promptly arrested. He challenged his arrest in court, saying that it violated his Fifth Amendment rights. That is, you can't be imprisoned unless you're indicted by a grand jury. His case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court found in favor of the U.S. government. The internment camps continued to operate even up until March of 1946, nearly six months after the end of the war. Side note, the United States officially apologized for the internment in August of 1988 when Congress granted detainees a modest reparation. I mentioned before that there were two main theaters of war. This is not theater in the sense of plays and musicals. That's just the term military experts use to describe the place where the battles of war take place. The main theater directed at the Nazi regime in Germany was in Europe, and the person leading U.S. and Allied forces in Europe was Dwight Eisenhower, who later in the 1950s will become president of the United States. Eisenhower managed the wartime coalition that essentially consisted of Great Britain and its Commonwealth, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and any resistance forces from France, Poland, and other European countries that happened to make their way to Britain. Eisenhower is largely credited for initiating the air bombing campaign over Germany and coordinating the extraordinary invasion of German-occupied France with the landing of Normandy. Another leading general in the European theater was George Patton. Patton, along with the British General Montgomery, helped to defeat the Germans in North Africa, then created a staging ground for the invasion of Italy. Film note, watch the film made about him called Patton. It is a classic. It illustrates some of his weirder quirks, including his notion that he was the reincarnation of a Roman legionnaire fighting the Parthians. But I digress. In the European theater, there were three main turning points. The first, the Battle of Stalingrad, fought in a city on the Volga for control of access to the oil fields in Azerbaijan. It lasted six months with enormous casualties. 
But after Stalingrad, the Germans were on the run, chased by Soviet troops and decimated by the Russian winter. The second D-Day or Operation Overlord I mentioned previously. On June 6, 1944, Eisenhower commanded 200,000 troops to cross the English Channel into France. 4,600 ships, 11,000 planes attacked the German positions on the coast. Here's another film note, Saving Private Ryan. It has the best depiction of the landing of Normandy of any World War II film. And the last turning point, the Battle of the Bulge. This represented Hitler's last attempt to regain the upper hand, though by this point in the war, December 1944 to January 1945, he was essentially on the run. The map on the right shows that after the Stalingrad and the Battle of the Bulge, German forces were squeezed between Soviet forces in the East and the American and British forces in the West. The Soviets arrived in Poland, Britain moved toward Germany through the Netherlands, and the war became a mopping up operation after that. Hitler ended up committing suicide on April 30th, 1945, two weeks after FDR died of a stroke in the United States. Germany finally surrendered on May 8th, 1945, which from that time became known as VE Day, Victory Over Europe. Meanwhile, in the Pacific Theater, General Douglas MacArthur led command of U.S. forces. Initially, MacArthur evacuated U.S. forces from the Philippines in March of 1942, vowing, I shall return. He announced, I have returned in October 1944. By mid-1942, the U.S. stopped the Japanese advance at the battles of Coral Sea and Midway. You may recall that the main strategy they employed was island hopping, also called leapfrogging. U.S. forces didn't try to capture and hold every single island the Japanese controlled, but rather selected islands on their way to taking Japan proper. By mid-1944, Wake and Guam were cap captured, recaptured. By early 1945, the U.S. suffered 18,000 casualties in seizing Iwo Jima, and 45,000 in taking Okinawa. As I mentioned, FDR died in April, mid-April 1945. His vice president, Harry Truman, had largely been kept in the dark about the various initiatives to defeat German and Japanese forces. In particular, the Manhattan Project, the development of an atomic bomb. As president, he escalated air attacks on Japan. While he was at the Potsdam Conference with Stalin of the Soviet Union and Clement Attlee of Great Britain, working out details for the occupation and denazification of Germany, he received word that the atomic bomb was ready. Just four days after the Potsdam Conference, he authorized the use of the bomb on Hiroshima, August 6th. When the Japanese did not respond after the attack, he authorized use of the second atomic bomb on the city of Nagasaki on August 9th. The very next day, the Prime Minister of Japan, Suzuki, officially surrendered. Americans celebrate the fighting with Japan, the end of fighting with Japan, as VJ Day. By the way, this iconic picture of a sailor randomly seizing this woman on the street to kiss her actually belies the anger she felt when he did so without her permission. Some have taken Truman to task for using atomic weapons, especially because it ushered in the atomic and nuclear age we now live in, where several countries possess weapons of mass destruction. Truman's argument was that since the Japanese had shown no sign of letting up their control in the Pacific, a million or so American and allied soldiers were estimated to face their deaths in continued fighting. 
Ultimately, this was a war that resulted in a million casualties for the US, 325,000 dead and 700,000 wounded. Worldwide, the death toll was 50 million, more than four times the number dead in World War I. 